Today we're going to talk about combinational circuits, and I'll define combinational circuit in a moment. We're going to represent those combinational circuits with logic diagrams. Logic diagrams are yet another layer of abstraction uh, of a logic circuit. Remember those gate symbols are abstractions of the transistors that are inside of the gates. And now we're going to mix the gate symbols up with something that looks like wires and end up with a, gee, I did that wrong. Uh, I don't like surprising effects on the slides. Um, the gate symbols represent the corresponding gates that we talked about last time. Lines represent connections, that is, wires or traces on a chip. Now, here's, here's the thing about that. Um, we don't have power and ground connections at all. A real electrical circuit has to have those, but we, we just sort of assume that they're there and abstract them away so that we can look at how the logic fits together rather than how the electrical engineering fits together. Um, connections are shown with a heavy dot. So if there's no dot, and you can see on the, in the circle there uh, a couple of wires that cross without a dot, those are not connected. The ones that are connected have that heavy dot. Okay, so a combinational circuit is a digital logic circuit, um, the output of which is determined, and I spelled that wrong, and you know it's probably been spelled wrong since 2016, um, is determined solely by its inputs. So the inputs of a combinational circuit determine the output. Now the output goes through all of those gates and gets massaged around, but the implication is that combinational circuits have no memory. The kind of circuit that has a memory is called a sequential circuit, and we'll talk about those on Monday. Boolean algebra deals with operations on binary digits and produces binary digit outputs. Um, Not, not exactly connected with that statement, but also true, is arithmetic operations can be expressed as truth tables. And, and we'll see how to do that as the, as the class goes on today. There is a mechanism that allows us to build a digital logic circuit that can compute any function we can express as a truth table. So to try to restate that a different way, if I can write something as a truth table, I can build a digital logic circuit that computes that function. This is very cool. Now, Andrew Tannenbaum, who has written a whole bunch of computer books, including maybe one of the best um, undergraduate computer architecture books there is, wrote in that book, a computer that cannot add is unthinkable. Um, he didn't know the IBM Model 1620 computer like I did. Um, the 1620 could not add. Instead, it used a table lookup to, to find sums. And if you remember maybe about the first grade, um, you might have seen a table of sums. So up in the left corner, 1 plus 1 is 2, and 1 plus 2 is 3, that kind of table. The 1620 could not add. It used a table lookup to do that stuff. Um, the code name for the 1620, the IBM code name for the 1620 was Cadet, and the IBMers said that means can't add, doesn't even try. So... Tannenbaum, who is usually right when he's talking about computer architecture, kind of missed that one. We looked at binary addition when we were looking at binary numbers, and you have seen this table before. Um, in, at this point, we're interested only in the sum, not in the carry. So 0 plus 0 is 0, 1 plus, uh, 0 plus 1 is 1, 1 plus 0 is 1, 1 plus 1 is 0. 
Now there's a one to carry, but we're only interested in the sum, okay? So I have in that sum column a 0, 1, 1, 0. And guess what? If I rewrite that as the truth table, that's the truth table for exclusive or. And what that means is that I can use an exclusive or gate to produce the sum part of a binary addition. Um, if we rewrite the carry as a truth table, and the A and B are the same as the A and B that we saw on 0 plus 0 is 0, okay? Um, if A and B are 0, carry, and that's a sub O, carry out, because we're going to deal with carry ins in a little bit. Carry out is a 0. Um, 0 plus 1 carry out to 0. 1 plus 0 carry out to 0. 1 plus 1 um, carry out is a 1. Do you recognize that truth table? Yes, it's AND. Um, so if I have an XOR gate and an AND gate, I can build a 2-bit adder. That is 2 binary digits, not 25 cents, okay? Um, that's the AND function, and with the XOR gate and the AND gate, I can build an adder. And it works just like this. Um, the heavy dots are connections. Lines that cross without a heavy dot are not connected. So the two inputs A and B are connected to the XOR gate to produce the sum and also to the two inputs of that AND gate to produce the carry. Now, that thing is called a half adder for reasons we'll talk about in just a minute. All right. Um, how do we know it computes the sum and carry? Well, we can look at the two truth tables and compare to the circuit and that says, yes, indeed, that computes exactly what I say it does. Now, for more complex circuits, doing this with the truth table starts to get a little ugly, okay? But for two inputs, I can, I can do this with a truth table. And it does just what I need it to do. However, we have a carry out, but we have no way of dealing with a carry in. And that means I can only add one pair of bits. And that's really kind of not good for anything. So the fourth one up there um, is 1 plus 1 is 2. Sum is 0 and the carry out is a 1. 1 plus 1 plus 1 is 3. That's a binary 3, that 1, 1. Um, and that happens when we have a carry in. So we now have to have to make provision for that carry in. Here is a truth table that has a provision for a carry in. Now, A, B, and C sub I are the inputs, and I have two outputs in that truth table, S and C sub O. C sub I is the carry in, C sub O is the carry out, okay? So those last two columns are both output columns. I've got three inputs, so I've got um, eight columns to the third. Um, if A, B, and, and carry in are zeros, sum and carry outs is zero. If A, B, and carry in are one, sums a one and carry outs a, a zero. If I have a zero, one, zero, I still have a one with a carry out of zero. Zero, one, one. Now I have a sum of zero and a carry out of one. 1, 0, 0, I have a sum of 1, a carry out of 0. 1, 0, 1, sum is 0, carry outs 1. 1, 1, 0, sum is 0, carry outs 1. And three ones gives me a sum of 1 and a carry out of 1. That's the same thing we saw put together as an addition um, just a few minutes ago. And I kind of got ahead of myself. Um, the sum is a 1 when the number of input 1s is odd. Okay? And I should have told you when I introduced the XOR gate that it's sometimes called the odd function. Um, if I didn't say that in class, it was in the assigned reading. Okay? I can compute that with two XOR gates. Um, 
the sum is A exclusive OR B, and then another exclusive OR with the carry in. Okay? So here are my two XOR gates. I've got a carry in in the two inputs A and B. Um, the gate labeled V computes A XOR B, and then the gate labeled W computes V, the XOR of A and B already, with carry in and produces a sum. Carry out is true when I have both A and B or C sub I and one of A or B. So you can look there, the, the cases where carry out is true are highlighted in the output column. And if we think about that, carry out is A and B or A X or B and C sub I. The A X or B is one of A or B and C sub I. Okay, so we saw V and W, they're still there. Um, X computes A and B and Y, they're both AND gates, computes A X or B and C sub I. Now I have two carry outs. But if you looked back at the truth table, which we're not going to do, um, only one of them can be true, not both of them. And I can just OR them together with an OR gate Z. It computes X or Y. And that thing is a full adder. That will add two bits, including a carry in, and produce a sum and a carry out. Now, there is another way of looking at the full adder. We, we kind of built that up from the Boolean algebraic expressions. But there is another way of looking at it, and it is this. Two half adders, remember the half adder was an XOR gate and an AND gate only. Uh, now I got two of those. One of them produces the sum and carry from A and B, and the other one adds the carry in to that. And then the OR gate there at the output um, ORs the sum and uh, ORs the two carryouts together. Okay? How cool is that? That's why Tannenbaum said a computer that cannot add is unthinkable. Um, we got five gates there and that's all it takes to do a one bit binary addition, including carry in. There is the same diagram that you just saw. I've turned it on its side, okay? But it's the same diagram. And I drew a box around it. And then I put a label on the box that said full adder. I have it abstracted away everything that is inside the box. I built it up and I said, now we know how that has to work. We don't need to worry about it anymore. Now I have a box that is a full adder. It has three inputs, A, B, and C sub I, and two outputs, C sub O and S. Now adding two bits, A and B, isn't really very exciting. If I wanted to add four pairs of bits. Here's four full adders. This thing is called a ripple carry adder for reasons we will see in a moment. So I got four full adders, A sub zero, B sub zero, and we wire the carry in for the rightmost full adder. Um, we just connect that to a logic zero. Here's the rightmost bit of the sum. Look what happens to the carry. It goes to the next full adder to the carry in. And it produces S sub 1 and a carry out that goes to the next full adder. 
and it produces a sum and a carry out. Finally, at the left end, we have bit three of the sum and carry out for the whole four bit addition. What would I need to do to make an eight bit adder? Add four more of those. 64 bits? 64 of those. This is the reason that we can have chips with 2 billion transistors and they're right. If you tried to build software with 2 billion lines, there's no chance it would be right. Okay, Windows 11 occasionally just stops talking to the network. There's a mistake in there somewhere. Rebooting causes it to wake up and talk to the network some more. There's an error in Windows 11. Um, the last time anybody made an error that we know about in a CPU chip was a floating point error in the Pentium chip long, long ago. Um, and there was a joke. Um, the, the riddle was... Why did Intel call that chip the Pentium instead of the um, whatever the fifth one was? We did an 8086 and so on and so on. The answer was they added 4 and 1 and got 4.9998. Oops. But that was a long time ago. That was in the 1990s, so 30 years ago. We can build these chips with billions of inputs. I mean, with billions of transistors, billions of gates, and they work right. And they work right because we can do this kind of stuff. I started with an AND gate and an XOR gate, and now I have a 64-bit adder. PIF. Buildings kind of work that way, too. Not quite as neat as this, but there are only about four sizes of bricks. And there's really only one that's commonly used. There are a couple of, of widths of doors. Um, software, it's all different and all built up one piece at a time. The output of a digital logic gate depends only on its inputs. So if I have an AND gate with two zeros going in, I have a zero coming out. If I have an AND gate with zero one going in, I have a zero coming out. Only when I have a one one in do I have a one coming out. Changing the inputs changes the output. The transistors take a few nanoseconds to switch from on to off or vice versa. In, I think, chapter three of your textbook, there is a picture of a former student saying a nanosecond is this long. An electrical signal in one nanosecond can travel just under a foot. Now, I think the student actually had her hands a little further apart than that, but you get the idea. Um, so a few billionths of a second for a gate to change state. That's called gate delay, or sometimes propagation delay. Um, and it is never zero. The output is always delayed slightly from a change in the input. Well, we got, what did I say, five gates in that full adder. If I have a full adder that takes five nanoseconds, to produce its sum and its carry out, well, that means that the carry in to full adder that produces S sub 1 isn't good, isn't right, until five nanoseconds after the inputs are stable. And the next one doesn't have its carry until another five nanoseconds, and the next one doesn't have its carry until another five nanoseconds. Um, 20 nanoseconds there. That's suddenly a pretty long time when we talk about computing. 
And if we did five nanoseconds per bit, a 64-bit adder would take 64 times five, which I can't do in my head, nanoseconds, but it's a lot of nanoseconds, okay? 60 times five is 300 of them. And then we'd have another 20, so 320, did I do that right? Good. I, sh I should learn not to do arithmetic while I'm standing up here. I should put the answers in my cheat sheet, but I haven't done that. All right, um, that is called a ripple carry adder for the obvious reason that the carry ripples from one full adder to the next one, and there's a delay in, in that, so there's a, a ripple effect. If you could look at that carry, you would see it ripple from the zeroth adder to the first one to the second one and so on. That makes that ripple carry adder not really good for adding more than some number of bits you can count without using your thumb. There are other ways, and I'm going to show you one. I'm going to show you an, another way of doing this. Um, and we're going to see no such thing as a free lunch. All right. The, you do not need to memorize, read, understand, or worry about the thing that's on the next slide. I want you to see it. But then, then you can forget about it, except maybe remember its existence. This is a 4-bit carry anticipation adder. If it takes 5 nanoseconds to perform an addition, this can deliver a 4-bit addition in 5 nanoseconds. And a 64-bit one of those can deliver a 64-bit addition in 5 nanoseconds. But holy smoke, as you can see, the complexity expands as we go to the left. We got, basically we've got a couple of half adders over here, but now we have some OR AND gates and I've got a three input OR gate. Um, and then I've got three inputs, three AND gates and a four input OR gate. And it gets more complex each time we move left, each time we add a digit. No such thing as a free lunch. I can build fast adders, but they're way more complicated than that ripple carry adder. Um, one of you gave me haircuts as an example out, outside of computing of no such thing as a free lunch. You can go to Great Clips and get a $10 haircut. And guess what? You have a $10 haircut. Or you can go someplace that might charge you $20 or $25 and get a substantially better haircut. No such thing as a free lunch. Okay, that um, we have right here a four input OR gate. And we haven't talked about how that could work, um, but it's pretty easy. There's a three input AND gate. And if we were to build one out of two two input AND gates, we'd do that. What we would really do is take the handful of transistors that's in those two AND gates and wire them together to give us a three input AND. But we don't need to worry about it in this class. That's for the electrical engineers to worry about. Okay? So now you can believe that there's such a thing as a three input AND gate. Um, if I wanted a four input AND gate, could I do it? Sure. I can do it with OR gates and XOR gates. I can do it with any gate that we have looked at. Okay, I told you a few minutes ago that we could build a digital logic circuit that computes any function we can represent as a truth table. And I'm gonna show you how to do it. Um, I will not ask you to do this on an exam, but I will ask you to remember the name of this technique. Okay, you don't have to be able to reproduce it. If you were taking a computer science or computer architecture course, yes, you'd have to do it. <clears throat> In this case, all I want you to remember is the name, and it's the sum of products method. 
the sum of products method will generate a correct circuit for any truth table. And it's actually pretty simple to do. You provide for each variable in the truth table, you provide one NOT gate. I provide an AND gate for each row of the truth table where the output is a one. Um, and those are called product terms if you're speaking computer architecture. The AND gates have to have an input for each variable. So if I've got three variables, I need three input AND gates. But I only need an AND gate for each row of the truth table where the result is a one. Then I connect the AND gates according to the product terms, and I'll show you what that means in a diagram in just a second. And finally, connect all the AND gates to an OR gate. So you're going to remember from this, you're going to remember some of product's method. Let's do an example. The majority function produces a 1 when the number of 1s in the input is um, a majority. In this case, more 1s than zeros. I've got three inputs, A, B, and C. And where there are more 1s than zeros are 0, 1, 1. 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1, 1. Those have ones in the output of the truth table. So those are the rows that we're interested in. We don't even have to care about the others. And that bothered me the first time I tried to do something with sum of products. Why do I not have to care about the outputs of zero? Well, we don't, we're going to produce ones where we need them and zeros all the rest of the time. So all I have to do is produce ones when I need them. All right, so there are the four rows that we're interested in. Okay, if I wrote that as a Boolean logic expression, um, look at that first highlighted row. It is 0, 1, 1. And that, if I wrote it as, as Boolean logic, is not A and B and C. 1, 0, 1 is A and not B and C. 1, 1, 0, A and B and not C. And 1, 1, 1 is A and B and C. And they're all ORed together. So that is the majority function expressed as a Boolean algebraic expression. Okay, that's called the minterm form. It is generally possible to simplify that. Um, and one technique for simplifying it is something called a Carnot map. You do not even have to remember the word Carnot map, okay? That's another one for the computer scientists and the electrical engineers. Okay, provide a NOT gate for each input. Now I have, I have three inputs. I've got six wires, and one of them is holding the signal that represents A. The other one is true when A is false, or the other one is one when A is zero. That's not A. And then similarly, I have B and not B, C and not C. All right, then I have AND gates. I had four rows of ones in the truth table, so I need four AND gates. I have three variables, so I need three input AND gates, four of them. The first product term is not A and B and C. There's my not A, there's my B, there's my C. That AND gate computes not A and B and C. And then I wire all the rest of them to compute the other, other three terms. And there they are. And those all get ORed together. So I supply a four input OR gate, and there is a digital logic circuit that computes the majority function. How cool is that? All right, that thing is called sum of products, and sum of products is something to remember. Okay, how to do it is not something to remember. I went through it so you would believe it, right? If I just stand up here and say, I can magically produce a digital logic circuit for any truth table, that, that gives the, the what look 
but now you should believe that I can magically produce a digital logic circuit that computes any truth table. Right? Good. All right. So there's the truth table again, and that circuit computes it. This is very, very cool. And there is our expression again. Okay. Billions of transistors, B billions, and maybe even tens of billions in, the, in 2024, of transistors in a modern CPU chip. God, be hideously complex. And I told you last time that there are automated tools for designing this stuff. That we're, we're looking at the way computers were designed in perhaps 1950. Um, just, just to see how, how the innards work. The designers who are designing the billion chip computers use automated tools to do that. Um, and we, we saw the ripple carry adder, that was one of the building blocks. That carry anticipation adder is another one. It's a lot more complex, but it, um, it's a building block. We can combine them, the various building blocks, we're going to look at several of them, into more complex structures. Modern computer designs depend on a relatively few building blocks. And by relatively few, we can almost count them on our fingers. There's more than that, but there aren't thousands of them. There are probably thousands of different components in this building. There are not thousands of different components in a billion transistor chip. Okay, so one of those building blocks is the thing called a decoder. In chapter three, we're going to find out that machine level instructions include an operation code. And the reason that we're doing what we're doing today is I want you to believe that that operation code can actually drive digital logic and do what the operation code commands. I want you to have the understanding of what's going on inside this stuff, even though we're going to do an understanding at a fairly high level. That operation code, and it's just a number, gets decoded into a bunch of signals, a flock of signals, that control what the CPU does. So the decoder building block takes an n-bit binary number. If I had a 4-bit instruction code, I would have a 4 to 16 maybe decoder. It produces 1 out of n signals. So let's look. Here's a one-bit decoder. Um, if A is a one, the one output is turned on. If A is a zero, um, the zero output is turned on. The zero output's computed by that NOT gate. If a one goes in, the one LED lights up. If a zero goes in, well, that one LED is going to be turned off because it's getting a zero input, right? But the NOT gate takes a zero input and turns it into a one output. So that's a one-bit decoder. Here's a two to four decoder. And it's exactly the same principle, except now I'm using some AND gates to AND together the two outputs. A and B, and exactly one of the outputs, 0, 1, 2, or 3, will be turned on depending on the number, the 2-bit number now, that appears at the inputs A and B. And once again, you don't need to know how to, de how to define, design these. I want you to believe that they work. If we have a 0, 1 input, we get a 1 out of that NOT gate that is connected to A, and so I have NOT A and B 
in that AND gate labeled 1. That one is turned on and all the others are off. That's a decoder. Another one of the building blocks is the multiplexer. It's kind of the reverse of a decoder. It takes an, although the actual reverse is something called an encoder. Was there a question over here? No, okay. Um, a multiplexer takes an n-bit control signal and selects one of n inputs and connects it to the output. So if I have a 0, 1 input, if I have a 0, 1 control input, input 1 is connected to the output of that multiplexer. So I can select one of n signals to be output and do something with it. So here's how that might work if we did a if we designed it. Once again, I have a NOT gate for each input, a bunch of AND gates, and I've ordered the outputs together. This is the same thing that, that we looked at when we did some products. Same, same exact principle. Shifting. Um, many of you figured out that 3E0 is 16 times 3E, and 3E00 is 16 times 3E0. Adding a 0 on the right multiplies by the base. I can add a 0 on the right to a ten, base 10 number and multiply by 10. I can add a 0 on the right of a base 2 number and multiply by 2. Okay. Um, I can divide by 10, base 10 number, by chopping off a digit on the right. And the digit that's chopped off is the remainder. I can do division, multiplication and division by 2 the same way. Um, so here is a multiply by 2. This is the multiply piece, shift left. Um, we supply a 0 on the right. Input D0 becomes output S1. Um, Input D1 becomes S2, D2 becomes S3, D3 goes into the bit bucket because finite precision arithmetic. That leftmost bit is discarded. Going the other way, we supply a zero on the left and then shift D3, D2, and D1, and D0 goes into the bit bucket. Or it can be the remainder after division. We can actually do something with that one. Those are wired shifts. There are ways to build shifters with digital logic. And here's one. Once again, you don't need to know how to do this. You just need to believe that it can be done. Um, I have inputs for shift left and shift right. And then I have a bunch of AND gates and some wires that cross each other going left and right and some OR gates ORing everything together. However, I might not want to shift at all, or I might want this thing called an arithmetic shift, which I will describe in just a moment. But notice, I've got a little scale, a little uh, legend on the right, and it says an input of zero, zero says no shift. So I might, I might not always want to shift something. Okay, so zero, zero gives me a no shift, um, I'm sorry, zero, zero gives me a shift left. Zero, one gives me a no shift. Um, one, zero, shift right logical, which is the same thing we just saw. One, one, shift right arithmetic. An arithmetic shift right preserves the sign bit. Instead of supplying a zero, we copy that um, leftmost bit when we shift. Preserving the sign bit is exactly what you want to do if you're dealing with two's complement numbers. A logical shift just supplies a zero. Um, a, uh, an arithmetic shift preserves the sign bit. And once again, there's the design. There are a few other building blocks. There aren't very many. Um, there are a few others. We're going to see some of them in the next class. 
it is my belief, the slide says possible, maybe even likely, that the existence of these building blocks, and there aren't very many of them, we've looked at, at, at all of the most important ones this morning. We gave them each just to kind of lick in a promise look, but there are not very many of these fundamental building blocks. That probably explains why we can design hideously complex chips that work, that do not have errors. If I'm building something and I only have maybe 20 or 25 components, it's pretty easy to get it right, even if the whole thing is complex. Um, basic Legos, not, not all of the fancy build the Starship out of, I have a friend who builds Starship Enterprise out of Legos, but basic Legos, there are only a few different parts and kids can do all sorts of stuff with those. Kind of the same idea. There are several levels or scales of integration. Small scale integration, um, when I used to teach the computer architecture course in computer science, and we would go to, we, at, in those days, we had a digital logic lab and we'd build this stuff um, out of chips. Small scale integration packages gates, packages a verb in this case. Um, so if you look at the, at the logic diagram for that little bug looking chip, what's in there is four AND gates. And then there's a connection for power up at the top left labeled V sub CC and for ground at the bottom right. And a little notch in there that identifies where pin one is. But what's in there is gates. You'd have it, to use that, you have to wire a bunch of them together to do whatever you wanted to do. But if I wanted to build that majority function, I could take some AND gate chips, some OR gate chips, and some NOT gate chips and wire it right up. And it would do that computation. For those of you who are inspired by this, all one maybe of you, um, there is in D2L a digital logic simulator that will run on Windows 11. Um, it's labeled as optional, but you can download it and build circuits with it. You don't have to for this class, but if, it, if, if that one, if this stuff rings your chimes, there's a toy you can play with. Medium scale integration packages simple functions. So I might have a chip that is a 32-bit adder. Okay. And so I would need um, 96 pins plus power and ground uh, so that I could have 32-bit inputs, 32-bit output, power and ground. And I probably need another pin for carry. So I'd have a bunch of pins. Large-scale integration and very large-scale integration packages either complex functions or complete systems. So if you were looking at, at the semiconductor die of a CPU chip from five or 10 years ago, it might look something like that, where, where each one of those little things that you can, um, that you can visualize represents a transistor or some other component. But as you can see, here's a whole bunch of, of just alike. And here's another whole bunch of just alike. And that is why designers can do this stuff and make it work. Okay, thanks very much. Have a nice weekend and I'll see you on Tuesday.